Thanks, Moira. Uh, Paul Tripp is my guest. He's written this book, What Did You Expect? Redeeming the Realities of Marriage. He is a pastor at um, the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, he also is a professor of pastoral life and care at Redeemer Seminary in Dallas, Texas. He's also the director of the Center for Pastoral Life and Care in Fort Worth, Texas. And you must have a split personality because I don't know how you do all of this at the same time. How do you manage to be pastoring in Philadelphia and a, and a professor in Dallas and involved in Fort Worth all at the same time? I'm very thankful for the jet plane. <laughs> That's how. <laughs> it would be impossible without that. Yeah, like me, you live in airplanes, right? <laughs> That's right. Well, welcome. It's great to well, have you here. To hear. Now, uh, this is a very big book. Um, it's got almost 300 pages, and there's no way we can cover it all. But I, uh, a few things. At the beginning of the book and at the end of the book. I think it's at the beginning you talk about grace-based uh, grace based marriage, and then at the end of the book you say grace is a, um, a lifetime warranty on marriage. Explain what you mean. You know, one of the things I, I think that people don't understand is that Jesus didn't just die for my past or my future, he died for my here and now. People don't understand the present benefits of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and maybe that, that means I gotta first understand how deep my need is for that grace. Um, one, of the reasons, one of the reasons I wrote this book is that I'm a man who hasn't appreciated marriage books because I think that they talk about the location of the problems, but they don't talk about why we struggle in living with one another. I mean, everybody who's listening who's married right now has been disappointed in their marriage in some way. Why is that? Why is it that all of us struggle in some way in these primary relationships of life? What does the Bible say about that? And how does Christ meet us at the point of that struggle. It's really what the book is about. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, again and again, you're making the point that um, these six commitments that uh, precede every chapter are, are really expressions of grace. Um, if, if you want to be vindictive, if you want to get even, if you want uh, constant justice, you're never going to make it in marriage. Uh, there's a give and a take here. The, the six commitments are not rooted in my trust of my spouse. They're rooted in my trust of Christ. Right. When I realize the enormous eternal grace that I have been given. I want to give that grace to the people I live with. And that grace, giving that grace, radically alters the relationship. Right. I want to focus on, <clears throat> on uh, the chapter that you entitle <clears throat> Canceling Debts. Um, first of all, you talk about some of the, um, uh, the real challenges that people often face in marriage. And number one <coughs> is immaturity. I mean, as a pastor myself, I, you know, I, I've known people in their 70s and 80s who still haven't matured. Uh, how does immaturity uh, erode a marriage? Well, you know, I think of my own story when, when I was courting my wife and I thought that I was deeply, fully in love with her. I looked for that moment where I could say, you know, I love you. And I said that to her and she said, what do you mean you love me? What do you know about love? And I was offended when she said that, but she was, she was absolutely right. I was 17 years old. <laughs> I knew little yeah. about what love was about. Uh, most people who get married, at the age they get married, have all kinds of immaturity in them. And grace really does believe in process. Grace really does believe in delayed gratification. Grace is willing to hang in there because I love you and we're going to deal with that immaturity. We're going to grow up together and we're committed to going through the, the process of doing that. Let me say one thing that means. It means that we have to have a regular lifestyle of confession and forgiveness because I'm married to a flawed person who's living in a fallen world who still needs the grace of Christ. That person's gonna have a bad day. They're gonna make bad decisions. They're gonna say bad things. They're gonna have moments of selfishness. Well, duh, of course. And we've gotta have a way of dealing with that. Here's what happens in average marriage. I come to my husband or my wife, and I wanna point out a failure. The minute I do that, that activates that person's inner lawyer, 
And rather than saying thank you, I'm sure there are places where I'm immature. I definitely need help. I know I need to grow. I'm glad we're in a relationship where we can do that. That person is offended. They begin to defend themselves. They next tell the, tell the other person they're not the only sinner in the room. And we're off to the races. Instead of, think about this, any time my ears hear or my ears I see your sin, weakness, and failure, it's not an obstruction or an interruption or a hassle. It's grace. God loves you. He's put you in this relationship. He's going to reveal your heart so that other person can be part of God's instrumentality of help and change. That's a beautiful story. But we're living this other narrative where you cannot talk to me about those things. You cannot say I'm immature. You cannot say I failed. Then how will a marriage ever change? You've closed all the doors to change. Hmm. Um, I, I was going to, well, I'm going to ask you this question. You don't deal with it in the book, but where's, where's the line between being graceful and being an enabler of uh, dysfunction? You see, one of the things I love about the message in, of Scripture, the message of grace in Scripture, is grace never calls wrong right. Grace is needed because wrong is wrong. Hmm. And so being gracious doesn't mean I'm just going to live with your mess. It doesn't mean that at all. It means grace is about the way that we put those things on the table. Is this why you say a little, little later in the chapter that uh, f forgiving is not forgetting? That you need to be remembering your own need of grace and your own failures in the broader context of this relational dynamic where someone has hurt you? It's, it's not forgetting because I want to learn from those things. It's no longer holding those things against you is what forgiveness is. Right. I'm not going to treat you in light of all those, all those failures because we can never pass beyond them if I do that. And, and you know, people say forgive and forget. I mean, how do you forget unless you have some capacity to uh, put something into the dark recesses of your brain? I mean, of course you're going to remember, but you're not going to uh, hold it against someone. And my wife and I are regularly benefiting from lessons we've learned that we want to remember. Now, uh, you mentioned nurturing dislike. Talk to me about that. Is it possible to, to, to dislike someone you're trying to love? Sure. Sure. I think, I think it's possible for, for couples to, in one place, uh, have romantic feelings toward one another, maybe even places of appreciation. But what they've done is they've kept a record of wrongs, uh, that begins to structure the way I think about you. So I view you not in, f uh, in light of your strengths and uh, the, the benefits that you've brought to this relationship. I think of you in light of your darkest, weakest, uh, most immature things. They become the lens that I look at you with. So I've, I've nurtured that dislike. So hmm. in a moment, I don't expect the best from you. I'm actually expecting the opposite. And when you fail, I throw my hands up and say, here we go again, and I put up my protective wall. 